So again, I'd like to welcome everybody. My name is Mike, and I am the Planetarium Director at this planetarium behind me, which is the Jennifer Chalstey Planetarium in Jersey City, New Jersey. It is the largest planetarium in the entire Western Hemisphere. It is a converted domed IMAX theater. Our fourth birthday is Thanksgiving weekend coming up. We converted our theater into a planetarium. We can still show the movies we've always shown, but now can show you the nighttime sky and take you to the end of the universe as well. We'll be using our Digistar 6 software, which we use in our planetarium, uh, on screen as well for the program you're about to see about the eclipse. So before we get going, a few odds and ends. First of all, Zach and Andrew on our team are also joining us in the chat. So if you have questions about astronomy, the eclipse, and so forth, go ahead and put those questions in the chat, and they will answer that. This is a totally free program. We started doing these at the beginning of the pandemic as a service to the community. If anyone does want to support us via donation, there is a little purple donate button with our logo on it, which features the planetarium. And that is the only one true way that you can donate here. So support us if you'd like to, uh, or come see us uh, in person. We are open Thursdays through Sundays now from 10 to 5. We have planetarium shows every hour during the day. The planetarium is important to who LSC is and, in fact, opened back over Labor Day weekend 2020 when LSC itself opened. So, And the same folks that do our online shows do the shows right here in the Dome. I'm actually sitting here in the Dome giving the program. And uh, so maybe we'll see some of you here on site as well. We are currently in the final months of our great exhibit on Sue the T-Rex, the famous T-Rex skeleton, a traveling exhibit from Chicago. And that's here through the 9th of, uh, of January. So definitely check that out. And again, we are open here at the museum uh, Thursdays through Sundays uh, for, uh, for the foreseeable future. All right, so thank you again for joining us. And what we're going to be doing next is talking a little bit about this eclipse and what to see and why this eclipse happens and talking a bit also about a really special event as well coming up in uh, two and a half years, the solar eclipse over the Northeast. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. And so if you are out and about at 218 in the morning this coming Friday. So staying up late on the 18th, on Thursday night, it becomes Friday the 19th. Early on the 19th, you'll see the moon darken and possibly turn this shade of copper or red. Now, I cannot emphasize this enough, but I probably will. Do not go out on the night of the 19th and try to see the eclipse. You'll have missed it by one day. This happens early, early in the morning on the 19th in what fellow New Jerseyan Frank Sinatra would call the wee small hours of the morning. The lunar eclipse is going to last for hours. It's going to start at 2.18 and go to 5.47 in the morning Eastern Standard Time. And the maximum eclipse, when 97% of the moon will be in the shadow of the Earth, that will be at 4.02 in the morning. Now, I tried to get the time changed. I know it's inconvenient, but astronomy waits for nobody. So if you want to see this, set the alarm and uh, poke your head out and check it out early in the hours of the 19th. So that is a, should be quite a lovely event. There's various mixed predictions for the weather that morning, but one nice thing about lunar eclipses is they last for hours. This is, in fact, the longest eclipse of the 20 first century. So you'll have many hours to try to catch a clear spot, even if you do have some intermittent cloudy skies on Friday morning. All right, so having said that, let's go ahead and we're going to go out to look at the nighttime sky as we would see it this coming Thursday. So we're going out Thursday night, uh, November 18th. Uh, we're here two hours before sunset. And look at the time, two 36. So two hours before sunset is 2.36. That means the sun goes down at 4.36 this time of year. We're off daylight saving time. We have a very early sunset here in the great northeast. We're going to go ahead and uh, 
go into the evening. We'll go to about 530. So yes, very early darkness now that the time has changed. And here's what you'd see really pretty much anywhere uh, in the great northeast uh, at 530 or adjusted for the time zone in your area of North America as well. And so here at 530 on Thursday night, if you look around to the east, you will see the full moon rising in the eastern sky. Things rise in the east and lunar eclipses can only happen during a full moon. So here you have a full moon coming up. And in fact, the moon will be right next to a little tiny cluster of stars called the Pleiades throughout this evening into the morning. The Pleiades are a tiny star cluster, but they must have a really great agent. Everyone knows and loves the Pleiades. They're called Subaru in Japan, and they not only named their automobile after it, there's a picture of the Pleiades on every Subaru car ever made. So you can kind of try to spot the Pleiades as the evening goes on. Full moons always rise around sunset and set around sunrise. And for most of the evening, this will, in fact, appear to be a regular full moon until we get to about 218 in the morning. So here we are at 218. And again, the moon's looking pretty normal still. It is now the 19th. It's early Friday. Here we have the Pleiades again right next to the moon. And then things will begin to change. As you watch the moon here, it'll begin to darken. One limb will appear to get darker and darker over the next hour or so. You may also see the moon turn orange. So the actual peak, the deepest moment of the eclipse, will be at 4.02 in the morning, Eastern Standard Time. At this point, 97% of the moon will be in the dark inner shadow or umbra of the Earth. We'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. So it's not quite a total lunar eclipse when the entire moon is inside the Earth's dark shadow. But it's, we're 97% of the way there, and it should look for all intents and purposes like a full-blown total eclipse of the moon. So things will get a little bit darker. Of course, the moon brightens the sky. So when it's dim like this, you'll have a better view of things like the Pleiades, which are conveniently located next to the moon uh, here on the evening of the 18th into the 19th. So that's the peak. And then as the moon works its way down the sky, the moon will work its way out of the shadow of the Earth. It'll become brighter and brighter, and it will end pretty much right as the moon sets and as day begins to break. It'll be over by 5.50 or so in the morning. So that is the eclipse, and that is what to expect here on the East Coast. I know most of our viewers are on the East Coast, beginning at 2.18, the peak at 4.02, and then ending as the moon sets at 5.50, just before daybreak, early, early, early on the 19th. Not on the evening, but instead on the early morning of the 19th. Uh, I just think solar uh, lunar eclipses are among the best sky events. You, they last for hours. You don't need any special equipment. You don't need a telescope. There is no safety concern. You don't need special filters like you do with a solar eclipse. And it's a great do-it-yourself experience. So definitely uh, check that out. Uh, the only uh, thing, of course, is that it, we certainly are in... Uh, November here, and there's always a chance for some scattered cloud action or worse. But uh, in a moment, I'll talk about some other places and other parts of the country that have webcasts if you can't see it through our uh, northeastern skies. So I was saying a moment ago that you only have eclipses of the moon during the full moon phase. So, of course, in the course of an average month, the moon goes through its whole series of phases. And if we begin, for example, with a new moon, which is the moon you can't see. So here we are looking at, there's the sun, there's the earth, and there's the moon. So during the new moon phase, the moon is right in between the earth and the sun. Now half the moon is lit, half the moon is always lit, but we can't see the lit side at all when the moon is new. And this, by the way, is the setup for a solar eclipse. Only during a new moon is the moon in the right position 
every six months somewhere on Earth to block the light of the sun. Now, if we go on through the month, as the moon goes around the Earth and moves away from this new moon phase, you'll see more and more and more of the lit side of the moon. It goes through being a crescent, then a first quarter, until we finally get 14 days after the new moon to the full moon phase. So during a full moon, you again have a straight line between the sun, the earth, and the moon. But now the earth is in between the sun and the moon. We're seeing the entire lit side of the moon during a full moon. And only during this configuration is the earth in just the right place, again, every six months or so, to block the light of the sun from falling on the moon and therefore causing a uh, lunar eclipse. And as we go past this phase and we head towards the third quarter moon, uh, about a month after that last new moon, we'll have a new moon again. Of course, the whole idea of the month comes from the orbit of the moon around the Earth and its sequence of phases. So only have, you can only have lunar eclipses during full moons. That's uh, during the laws of the universe, as it were. I'm going to pause and see if there's any questions that I need to. Uh, yeah, we do see some predictions that uh, we may be seeing some clouds and rain uh, here in this area on early on Friday morning. And yeah, that is a concern. Although, again, it's uh, first, I mean, unlike really, really, really faint events, uh, at least we have the moon to look at. And we have several hours to try to catch it if we're going to try to catch it. And also other places will be doing webcasting of this. So in terms of uh, what's caught going on here. So here again in this diagram, we have the sun. There is the earth. And here is the moon orbiting the earth. So the earth here casts a dark shadow, a cone-shaped shadow into space. And that is called the umbra, which is a Latin word for shadow. Umbrella comes from the same root. So this dark inner shadow of the Earth is what matters. So a partial eclipse of the moon begins, as we see here, when the moon begins to go into that deep inner shadow of the Earth. So a partial eclipse is when the moon is partially inside the umbra. A total lunar eclipse occurs when the entire moon is inside the umbra. That's when it turns most dark and most reddish. And then as it exits the umbra, it becomes a partial lunar eclipse again. So partial means that part of the moon is inside the umbra. A total lunar eclipse means the entire moon is inside the umbra. Now, I need to clarify there's another kind of eclipse that is an absolute non-event, at least to the naked eye. And that is called the penumbral phase of an eclipse. So besides this dark inner shadow, the moon casts a wider, fainter shadow called the penumbra, which means the almost shadow. But almost doesn't cut it in this regard. The penumbral phase of the eclipse on Friday morning will start at 102, so over an hour before the partial phase begins. But during a penumbral eclipse, you can't really see any change whatsoever in the moon. It looks like a normal full moon. So the penumbral phase is a non-event except for academic reasons. So, and there are some eclipses of the moon that are only penumbral. And I have friends who made plans to go hiking to see the wonderful penumbral eclipse. Ignore the penumbral phase. You won't see anything in terms of the brightness of the moon diminishing. That begins when the moon goes into the umbra, which will happen again at 2.18 in the morning, Eastern Standard Time, early Friday morning. i check for many questions before we explain a little bit about why we have the copper color to the moon. I could just see that our staff are also there answering those questions. Thank you, Zach. And I think Andrew's out there as well answering questions. So, okay, so why is the moon turned copper? Why is it called a blood moon? Well, if the moon had no atmosphere, when it got between the sun and the moon and blocked off the sun's light, the moon would just turn dark and that would be it. But of course, we do have an atmosphere. Light comes from the sun, strikes the Earth's atmosphere, and our atmosphere 
tends to stop the short wavelengths of bluish light. Of course, the light of the sun is a mix of all colors. The blue light, the shorter wavelengths, are more easily scattered by our atmosphere. And in the process of being scattered, they also turn our air the color blue. The longer wavelengths of red light tend to penetrate our atmosphere better, get past the Earth, and continue on to the moon. So during these lunar eclipses, the bluish light is stopped by our atmosphere, but the longer wavelengths of red light continue through and strike the moon and create that really striking effect of a copper-colored moon, or more melodramatically, a blood moon. If we can imagine this perspective of looking at our dark shadow going into space, and then the moon enters the umbra, beginning the partial phase, when it's total, it's entirely inside the umbra, and then it emerges from the umbra uh, anywhere from a few minutes to a few hours later, depending on how it, how it hits the umbra, as it were. So this is actually going to be the longest lunar eclipse of the entire 21st century. And I'll get into that in just a moment. So there's a number of things that are really great about lunar eclipses. One is that... You're looking at the moon. You're not trying to find a faint little streak of light during a shooting star shower. So you're going to find it no problem. Also, it lasts for hours. It's not a blink and you'll miss it kind of event. And half the world gets to see it, weather permitting, of course. So everything in the darker pink here is where the moon will, the eclipse of the moon will be visible early on Friday or on the 18th, depending on your time zone. So if you're anywhere in this area, like anywhere in North America, for example, and I think all of our viewers so far have been from North America, you're going to see this eclipse if, you, uh, if the weather behaves itself. So they're seen by half the world, unlike, say, a total solar eclipse. And they last for hours, and you're looking at a thing that's easy to spot in the nighttime sky, the moon. Even when it's dark, you'll have no problem finding it. Now, why it is the longest lunar eclipse of the 21st century is because as the moon goes around the Earth, it's not a perfect circle. Like nothing that orbits anything goes around in a perfect circle. It's an oval. And so the moon, as it goes around the Earth, can get as close to us as 224,000 miles, which is really close for a celestial body. So if you have a full moon, when the moon is close like that, the recently invented term, it actually goes back to 1979, a term invented by an astrologer, is they call it a supermoon. It's a moon that occurs when the moon is a little closer than normal and is therefore a little bigger and a little brighter. But we don't have a super full moon on Thursday and Friday. And uh, we have instead essentially a mini full moon occurring when the moon is at its most distant point from the Earth as it orbits our home planet. So when the moon is at its furthest point, it is about 250 two or so thousand miles away. So it's 30,000 miles further away than it is when it's at its closest. So here it is. It can be as far as 252,000 miles. So 30-ish thousand miles further away than it is at its closest point. And a basic law of celestial mechanics is the closer you are to something, the faster you move. That's why Mercury goes a lot faster than Pluto around the sun. And being further away, this moon on Thursday and Friday is going to move a little more slowly than it normally does and will therefore take longer to pass through the umbra, giving us an eclipse that lasts three and a half hours. So got lots of time to observe this and all of that phase, if you can see it from the beginning uh, to the end, should be quite striking. So again, this whole idea of the moon not orbiting in a perfect circle has also invented, gave us this idea, this concept that caught fire about 40 years ago of the supermoon. But if you have a supermoon, you got to have a mini full moon as well. And that, in fact, is what we'll have, which uh, should make very little difference in the brightness of the moon on Thursday and Friday morning, but will give us a longer eclipse than normal. Okay, so kind of going over the timing here. So as we mentioned in the beginning, 
Uh, then the East Coast here, Eastern Standard Time, is going to begin at 2.18 in the morning, Friday morning, early, early, and go to 5.47 on Friday, the 19th of November, with the maximum moment being at 4.02 in the morning. And all over the part of the world that can see it, the eclipse happens at about the same time. You just have to adjust for the time zones. So if you have friends who are in the Chicago area, anywhere in, in the central zone, it'll begin at 118, go to 447, and the peak will be at 302. So exactly one hour before the timings here on the East Coast. And again, this is true for the whole central time zone. If you have friends in Denver or anywhere else on Mountain Time, again, it'll be one hour earlier, beginning at 1218, going to 347 in the morning, and the peak being at 202. And then finally, uh, if you have friends in the West Coast in Pacific Standard Time, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, and so forth, it's going to actually start on the 18th, late in the evening, at 11.18. Uh, we'll go to 2.47 on the 19th, then we'll be at its deepest phase, the 97% into the Umbra at 1.02. So really handy for any number of reasons. Now, you know, I've, I've done a lot of live programming with eclipses and other events. I know the weather is going to always be a thing. So uh, there's also some good websites. If you're striking out with weather here in the Great Northeast or wherever you are, here are a few other examples. We'll put these in the chat as well. And so time and date it's a really good site for any number of reasons. It's really coming into the fore as a leading site for sky information. They're doing a webcast that night. And also, you can enter in your location and get the exact timings for this eclipse and for various upcoming eclipses as well. So that's a really good site to refer to. And it's great to see if they're also doing webcast now. And a couple of our colleague planetariums also have webcasts going on. So uh, the weather is often nice in California. The famous Griffith Observatory, which has been in more movies than any other planetarium in the world, being in L.A., uh, is doing their webcast. We'll, we'll, in the chat, we'll give you the link to their actual YouTube page. And also the Adler, the first planetarium in the U.S., in, in Chicago, they also have a webcast. So we'll put the link to their actual YouTube page as well. So lots of good opportunities for checking this out, even if the weather does not cooperate here in the, uh, in the Northeast. So that is a nutshell overview of that. Before I go on to the next eclipse coming up, let me check to see if there's any more questions here. Yeah, so Andrew has put it in the chat. We do have the link to time and date. And that, again, is a site I'd really, really recommend. They're really, really good in terms of you just type in your location. It shows you all the upcoming eclipses, shows you when it's going to begin, be at deep in point, and when it's going to end. So that's a site that I use all the time now. Okay, so what if you're a purist and you say, Mike, 97% is not good enough for me. I want a total lunar eclipse. Or what if you're rained out? Or what if you don't want to be up at 4 in the morning? So you don't have long of a wait. The next total eclipse of the moon in the northeast will be May 15 and 16 of next year. That'll start at 1027 at night and will go to 155 on the morning of May 16. So that's a good sort of more towards the normal hours kind of lunar eclipse coming up. Uh, and that should be a really beautiful one as well. Of course, the weather, I don't know. I mean, it's the Northeast, right? Y'all live here. <laughs> it can be anything in terms of weather. Uh, so we could get beautifully clear days in, in January and, and rain in May. But anyway, that's the next one coming up. Uh, though, again, the eclipse here in two days, 97%. It's going to pretty much look to all intents and purposes like a total lunar eclipse. Now, speaking of eclipses, I would be remiss if I didn't promote the uh, really, really, really big solar eclipse event that's going to be here before we know it. So a, a lunar eclipse is a really beautiful sight. I absolutely love it. Some of the best memories I have for doing public astronomy have been doing lunar eclipse programming. Uh, and it's kind of more mellow because you have hours to check this event happening. You're not rushing to try to catch a few minutes of a magic moment. Having said that, there is nothing in astronomy as incredible as a total eclipse of the sun. 
And we have one coming up for parts of the Northeast on April 8, 2024. The, by sheer happy coincidence, the moon is just the right size at the right circumstance to block the entire surface of the sun, block out the sun's incredibly bright blazing light, and give you this awesome sight of the sun being, uh, being blocked by the moon and this beautiful ring or corona that shows around a total solar eclipse. So that again is coming up uh, on the 8th of April 2024, a total eclipse of the sun. And that will be uh, a sight that you will never, ever forget. If you've never seen a total solar eclipse, the land goes dark. The poor, confused birds begin to sing because I think it's nighttime already. Things cool down. There's an eerie silence. But it's not quite like night because everywhere you look around you, you can see a ring of sunshine. But where you are, it's dark. So any given sight on Earth, though, only sees a total solar eclipse on average once every 360 years. And this eclipse will be total in a, like all total eclipses, in a narrow band, in this case going from Mexico up through uh, Nova Scotia. The rest of us will wind up seeing a partial eclipse if we're using safe viewing devices. That's the other thing about solar eclipses is that you absolutely have to have a safe viewing device to see them except for the awesome total phase when the moon blocks out the entire blazing disk of the sun. Otherwise, you got to use solar filters to view a solar eclipse. So here is the path of the total solar eclipse on the 8th of April 2024. It's going to hit Mexico where, off of Mazatlan. It's going to go over Dallas, although just miss Houston. It's going to just miss Detroit. We're going to zoom in here a bit to look at the northeast and see kind of the key areas in the northeast where it's going to be total. So uh, areas like Buffalo and Cleveland are in really good position for this. So here it is. Detroit's going to just miss it, but Cleveland is going to be exactly in the middle of this yellow band, the path of the total solar eclipse. They're going to get uh, three minutes and 50 seconds of darkness, which is a good, healthy, long uh, total eclipse phase. In Rochester and Buffalo, it'll be three minutes and 40 seconds of a total eclipse. Burlington, it'll be three minutes and 30 seconds, and so on through Canada, through Newfoundland. So we here in New York City and in New Jersey, we're out of the total path, but we'll see a very deep partial eclipse, about 95% of the sun being blocked by the, the moon. But the difference between a total solar eclipse and a partial literally is the difference between night and day. With a safe viewing filter, it's kind of cool to see a big chunk of the moon, uh, of the sun being blocked by the moon. But the, moon, the sun is so incredibly bright that until you actually go into the total phase, the darkening doesn't happen. You could be in a 95% partial solar eclipse and not even know it was happening. That's how bright the sun is. So now is the time. If you want to see this, book your hotel rooms two and a half years early. Get those vacation requests in because it's going to be very, very uh, popular and a, a really special event for the entire area that is in the total phase. Again, April 8, 2024 which will be here before we know it. All right, so those are uh, some highlights about the eclipse. I just wanted to mention one thing before we go. So if you're going to be staying up trying to catch this event early on the 19th of November, this eclipse of the moon, you're going to have hours and hours to kill beforehand. So I wanted to point out that we do have three planets in the sky, and I'll show you where to find those. And then it's only take about five minutes or less. Uh, I'll then, because we, we're in the planetarium, we might as well use it a little bit. I'll show you these planets close up using our dome behind us. So looking uh, towards the sky here, uh, we're an hour before sunset on Thursday evening. We have three bright planets, or actually I should say two really bright planets and one kind of bright planet. As it gets dark, 
here about 5.30 or so. Uh, the brightest dot of light in the sky, looking towards the western sky, is the planet Venus. Bright because it's near to us, it's fairly big for an inner planet and covered in shiny clouds. The second brightest dot in the sky also is in the sky. That's the planet Jupiter. In a small telescope, you could even see the four big moons of Jupiter, the Galilean moons. And then in between, a fainter dot of light uh, between Jupiter and Venus, we also have another planet that is absolutely breathtaking, even in a small telescope. Uh, we can put recommendations for a couple of, of uh, small telescopes, by the way, in the chat. Orion makes a couple of great telescopes that are good first telescopes. Saturn, those rings uh, were first discovered in 1655. Still the most beautiful sight you can see in a telescope. And so these planets are in the sky, and they're going to be with us till the end of the year. So you have a couple of more months to go ahead and try to catch those planets, and they're kind of gathered low in the west as it's getting dark. Now, we have gone to all of these planets. In fact, we've gone to every planet in the solar system. So to wrap our show up, let's do a whirlwind tour of these three planets that we were looking at in the sky a moment ago, uh, beginning with the planet Venus, often called our sister planet. So Venus also, every so often, does eclipse the sun, but it's a little tiny dot. So it just moves across the sun in what's called a transit of Venus, which uh, historically have been very important moments. We had one back in uh, 2012. So the planet Venus, ironically, those clouds that make it lovely and bright also make it a terrible no-good place. Let me go ahead and bring this on here now. So here we are uh, looking at the planet Venus as seen by a Russian uh, probe that landed on Venus some years ago. And the planet Venus, in fact, is uh, unbelievably hot, 861 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, so hot that lead would melt on the surface of Venus. Uh, NASA so far has tended to observe Venus from orbit using radar to peer through its clouds. But interestingly, NASA has announced that it's going to actually send a mission to land on Venus in the next 10 years. So stay tuned for more news about our sister world, our very hot sister world that is raging at 860 Fahrenheit. Uh, so hostile that we'll probably walk on Pluto before we'll ever have anybody able to survive on the surface. Here you can see Venusian volcanoes. We confirmed recently Venus does, in fact, have active volcanism, the size of certain mountains even hotter than the average 860 temperature, and they realized they were seeing flowing lava. So that is the planet Venus, and that is going to be in our skies, getting lower and lower, but it's going to stay with us till the end of the year. And we also have the planet Jupiter. Jupiter is uh, often called the king of the planets. It is bright because it's really, 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 really big. You can fit approximately 1,300 Earths into the planet Jupiter. So even though it's 10 times as far away as Venus, it is quite bright. Not as bright as Venus, but brighter than any star in the sky. We have a mission here currently called Juno that's exploring the planet Jupiter. Jupiter has uh, about, about 80 known moons, four big ones, uh, and they kind of do little mini eclipses every so often where they pass in front of Jupiter and we can observe them. So Jupiter is going to be with us a little bit longer than Venus, but by early 2022, it'll be gone from our skies as well. And then our grand finale, because... Uh, it is a rule that you have to show the rings of Saturn in every planetarium show. Saturn with us also until early uh, in 2022. Those rings of Saturn, its most distinctive feature, were, are so bright that they were discovered way back in 1655 by Christian Huygens. Uh, and uh, so this is centuries before the rings of Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune were discovered. And uh, speaking of moons, uh, one moon made the ultimate sacrifice, got too close to Saturn, got torn apart by its gravity, and turned into the rings of Saturn. Uh, although still having sacrificed one moon to become the rings, uh, Saturn still has more moons than any other planet in the solar system. The rings made primarily of little bits of ice, as small as a pebble and as large as a school bus. Razor thin, maybe 100 feet deep, even though they're 
maybe 50,000 miles across. So that's a little whirlwind, and also I just wanted to you know, hate to not do show off our planetarium, and we'll be featuring these planets as well in our Wonders of the Night Sky show that we offer uh, whenever we're open, which is, again, Thursdays through Sundays, as long as these planets remain in the sky. So I'll do a final check to see if there are any more questions before we go ahead and wrap up our program. Looks like our staff have been great at getting to the questions that people have. And so with that, I'll go ahead and uh, bring us back to the planetarium and get the lights back on. So yes, so uh, go ahead again. We hope uh, we have decent enough weather to at least have a brief view of this eclipse coming up early, early on Friday morning. Uh, have a go at that. Again, there's uh, some websites in sort of sunnier climes like LA that are doing webcasts that we can probably rely upon if we can't actually see it from here. And then again, a couple of things to note, May 15, 2022, the next total lunar eclipse. And then mark your calendars now, April 8 of 2024, a total eclipse of the sun over places like Cleveland, Rochester, and buffalo. So shuffle off the buffalo uh, as the song goes to check that out. Uh, you'll, never, you'll not regret chasing the awesome side of a total solar eclipse. So with that, I think we uh, have covered everything. Again, if you want to support us by donation, that little purple LSE button is the way to do that. If you want to come and check out our T-Rex exhibit, it's running here until the 9th of, of uh January, a wonderful exhibit featuring the most well-preserved T-Rex skeleton uh, fossil in history. And we'd like to thank you very much, and I really hope that we'll see some of you right here at this planetarium at Liberty Science Center someday. Thank you all so much.